So just last week, we're at 161 in the hospital, 32 ICU. Uh, this week, we're 181 uh, with 48 in the ICU. Um, we do meet regularly with the hospital leadership um, and uh, to talk about the, the number of people going into the hospital and the increase that we are seeing. And one question that I know we get frequently, and this came up last week, is if it's younger folks who are getting hospitalized, uh, why are we seeing an increase in the hospitalization? And the reason why is because even though uh, younger people are hospitalized at a lower rate than older people who, who, who are sick, um, the more people that you have sick, the more people will go into the hospital, even if they're getting uh, the hospitalization uh, rate is at a lower rate uh, for, that, for that younger age group. It's just there's more people getting sick, even with a smaller rate, more people will still end up in the hospital. So this is very important at this point to make sure we get vaccinated and slow the spread even amongst younger people in our community. Um, and with that, I can talk about the vaccination update as well. On the state's uh, vaccine dashboard, shows 226,825 Monroe County residents have completed their vaccination series as of today. Uh, 190,406 uh, had their completed series at this time last week at our briefing. So we're up from 190,000 to 226,000. In addition, 322,474 residents or 43.4% have received at least their first dose of vaccine compared to 289,000 or just 38.9% of our residents last week. Um, so let's turn this around though and talk about what that also means. So while we've had 322,000 residents who've received at least one dose um, of vaccine. That also means that we have about 300,000 eligible residents that have not started the vaccination process yet. Um, and if you add children who are not eligible yet, we're over 400,000 residents have not received a single dose of vaccine yet. So that also is important to keep in mind as we see the number of vaccinations and continue to increase we are also starting to see a surge in our cases increase as well. And how can those two things both be true at the same time? It's because even though we have over 40% of our residents have been vaccinated, there's still then almost 60% of our residents who have not. Um, more people in this community have not been vaccinated than have been vaccinated. And that's an important detail to keep in mind as we move forward and think about mitigation strategies uh, to reduce the spread uh, in our community. Last week, we announced that the Monroe County COVID-19 hotline was available to make appointments um, for residents in the city of Rochester for our community-based clinics in each of the four quadrants of the city. Um, but this week, we are excited to announce um, that that service has been expanded uh, to all of Monroe County uh, for appointments at the county-operated Rochester Riverside Convention Center, making it easy for those without internet access to make their life-saving vaccine appointment. So now any Monroe County resident, uh, regardless of where you live in the county, can call the COVID-19 hotline at 753-5555 to make their COVID-19 vaccine appointment. Uh, and that is for appointments at the Rochester Riverside Convention Center. So um, this is good news uh, in an effort to help bridge uh, the digital divide. We can make appointments right over the phone. Any eligible Monroe County resident can call 753-5555 and we'll make your appointment over the phone. Um, this, uh, the uh, convention center site, I want to remind folks, is very e is easily accessible. It's well maintained and, it, and the operation there uh, could not be smoother. Um, uh, I want to remind residents uh, in the media that the parking is validated and adjacent uh, and is available in the South Ave garage just adjacent to the convention center. There's also handicap parking available in front of the convention center right on East Main Street. So um, anyone who's apprehensive about driving to the convention center about where to park, if you have mobility issues, the, um, uh, the uh, handicap parking is right outside the front door on East Main Street. Park there and when you go into the building, if you do have uh, mobility restrictions, um, we have plenty of staff on hand. We have wheelchairs available uh, right inside the door and um, some very friendly staff who can help you around the building. So if you're, if you're intimidated by the large space, um, or the distance you might have to walk, we can absolutely help you with that when you arrive. Just park in the handicapped parking, go right in the front door, and our staff is there to help you out. Um, there are many vaccine appointments available 
uh, throughout the county right now as I speak, um, particularly also at the convention center. Um, uh, so there are appointments available for as soon as today, this afternoon, uh, through Saturday. In addition to that, the County Fleet Center has appointments uh, uh, available for tomorrow and Monday and Tuesday of next week. Our community-based vaccine clinics in the city of Rochester this week are uh, tomorrow at the Memorial AME Zion Church on Clarissa Street from 11 to 5. Saturday's clinic will be at the Jackson Rec Center again from 9 to 1, and Sunday's clinic will be at the Edgerton Rec Center from 1 to 5. Um, again, vaccine appointments for those clinics, convention center, um, are all at the hotline 753-5555. You can also make your appointment yourself directly on our website at monroecounty.gov. Um, you can also use the Finger Lakes Regional Vaccine Hub Appointment Finder um, at flvaccinehub.com to find all of the nearby available appointments. Um, another thing to point out is that the county received Pfizer vaccine this week, um, which uh, uh, this is to the county health department. Um, so the county run sites is Pfizer this week, which means that anyone 16 years old or older can get the vaccine. So this, I would remind parents, is a great opportunity uh, for your age el eligible children and your parents um, can get vaccinated together. Um, and this would be a great way for families to do their part to end the pandemic and get us back to normal. Um, and we don't know week to week if we're getting Pfizer or Moderna. So when we have Pfizer, it's a good opportunity uh, to get your uh, 16, 17, and 18 year olds uh, uh, vaccinated. I also wanna talk about the fact that we are about six weeks from Memorial Day. We are two months, into this, uh, uh, two months until the start of the summer. Um, and uh, I know we're all looking forward to the many great things that make Monroe County a great place to call home. Seabreeze Amusement Park is gonna be opening. Uh, the return of the Rochester Red Wings at Frontier Field, festivals, the Lilac Festivals and others, and outdoor concerts are right around the corner. But in order to get back to this full sense of normalcy, we need to continue to encourage vaccinating as many people in our community as possible and encourage our young people to do their part to slow the, sur the surge that we've been experiencing. And remember that the vaccine is not an immediate effect. So we are six weeks away from Memorial Day, a couple months away from summer. If you receive the Pfizer vac vaccine this week, Pfizer vaccine, you get your first vaccine this week, three weeks later, you get your second dose, and then two weeks later, is when you reach your full immunity. So there's a five week runway until you reach immunity from today's vaccine. Moderna, it's a four week uh, 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 time period until you get your second vaccine. You get a Moderna, you wait four weeks, you get your second shot, and then it's a couple weeks till full immunity. So you don't wanna think about where you are today when you're thinking about your vaccine. Think about where you wanna be in uh, five weeks from now six weeks from now and we are five or six weeks away from summer we are five or six weeks away from those uh those uh those summer activities and festivals and parades that we all want to get back to um so now is the time to be thinking about receiving that vaccine this week so that when we get to summer when seabreeze amusement park is open we're fully vaccinated and protected uh, as much as possible. So um, we have an abundance of appointments available this week at multiple locations around the county. It's, it's, uh, it's the most effective way really to end this pandemic. Um, so please talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors. If you've received the vaccine, talk to people about it, talk about your experience. Um, uh, and it's really easy to do at any of our county locations. Um, and uh, together we can end this pandemic and get back to normal. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mendoza um, and uh, he give us an update on things from his end. Thank you, County Executive. And uh, good afternoon to everybody and thank you all for being here as well. I wanna begin by talking uh, through a little bit of the new state guidance governing the reopening of our schools. I'm aware that there is a lot of confusion surrounding these state guidelines and I'll do my best to add some clarity for you today. Schools are now able to create reopening plans that comply with the new stipulations outlined <clears throat> by the state last week. Basically, any school that wishes to reopen more fully under these guidelines is creating a contract with the state agreeing to abide by the state rules. There is no formal approval process. Once a school community creates a plan that meets the state guidance, it can put that plan into place. 
Schools will need to post the plan on their website and send a copy to the state and local departments of public health. So what role does the local Department of Health play in this process? Well, I see two roles. First, we will work with the schools to help determine the best metrics to use when considering the risk of transmission here in Monroe County. Right now, we are recommending using the CDC metrics, which include four levels of indicators and thresholds for community transmission of COVID-19. These are different from the countywide metrics provided by New York State. So we are going to be reporting the CDC metrics and the New York State metrics on our daily report every Monday. Why are they different? The CDC metrics are based on the results of PCR tests alone. They do not take into account the antigen test results. The New York State metrics include both types of test results. As you know, antigen tests are more likely to be used to test asymptomatic people. For example, until recently, anyone who wanted to travel might get one of these before boarding a plane. The Department of Public Health here is recommending schools use the CDC countywide metrics for the time being. These are the most authoritative metrics available to us at this time. We may at some point review this and examine other measures of community transmission to use here in the county. But let me remind you, no matter what metrics we look at today, the number of positive cases in Monroe County is going in the wrong direction, as is the hospitalization rate. COVID-19 variants, which are known to behave differently than the original virus, must now be taken into the equation when we calculate our potential risk. Cases among school-aged children are climbing and we don't yet have a vaccine for children under the age of 16. So I urge school communities to proceed with caution, making sure to adhere to the state guidance and do everything we can to continue keeping our schools the safe place for our children to be during this pandemic. Now is not the time to throw caution to the wind. The second role of the Department of Public Health is one of enforcement. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we receive a complaint that a school is not adhering to the state guidance, we will investigate and work with the schools to rem remedy the issue if needed. If a problem persists, we will report the school to the New York State uh, Department of Public Health for violating its guidance. To be honest, I am less concerned about schools following the rule of the law than I am about monitoring the situation in schools under this new guidance. This pandemic is still evolving. If we see evidence that schools are no longer the safe spaces they have been under the previous state guidelines, we will act swiftly using every authority we have to contain a threat to public health. Our rules regarding quarantine have not changed. We will still consider physical distancing of less than six feet to be reason to quarantine if an individual ex is exposed to a person who tests positive. One or both were not masks and they worked together for more than 15 cumulative minutes. So to wrap it up, I am eager to see schools reopen more fully. As more and more of us are vaccinated, we will see the rate of community transmission drop and enjoy the benefits that follow. Fewer restrictions on schools, a broader reopening of our economy, the ability to travel more freely, and eventually take our masks off in most situations. But make no mistake, vaccination remains the best tool by far to get there. If you still have questions about the vaccines, please call your healthcare provider or talk to somebody you know who has already gotten the vaccine. So with that, I will hand it back over to Julie and Steve and we'll be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Dr. Mendoza. Jennifer Lukey from WHBC, you're up first. Um, good afternoon. Dr. Mendoza, I wanted to continue this conversation about schools because obviously we're hearing uh, from a lot of districts, a lot of families who had hopes that April 19th was going to be the day that many of their kids returned to school. Um, you mentioned enforcement. Um, for many months since schools have been open, you and County Executive Bellow have said that you feel like they are the safest place for kids. Yet teenagers, in most cases in Monroe County, will not be returning to school. How do you reconcile that? Well, that's what the numbers are showing us. Um, we know that the pandemic now is somewhat different than it was back in the fall. Uh, we are dealing with a population now that has a higher vaccination rate overall than what we had, obviously, in the fall when nobody had a vaccine. But we are also dealing with a different variant of the COVID-19 virus. And so in some sense, it's a little bit of a new pandemic. And so all of the things that we had done to quote, assume that our schools were the safest places to be in the community, I think we have to prove that again. And I do believe that's true, but I do want to follow the numbers. And so that's why it's in really all of our hands as a community, as parents, as schools, as students, 
uh, to take responsibility for our fate going forward. And if we can continue to demonstrate that the schools are in fact the safest places to be in our community, then I have no concerns with keeping the schools open. But as things evolve, if we start to see concerns, we will act quickly to try to keep the schools uh, as the safest places that we believe that they can be. I guess the question becomes, how do you measure that if the kids aren't in school? I know that some of the districts were hoping for perhaps pilot programs when it came to testing to prove that they believe they are safe. I also know that many of them purchase plastic, which is now essentially useless. So, I mean, when it comes to, are you willing to step at all outside these guidelines when it comes to any pilot programs for testing or when it comes to thinking outside the box a little bit, I guess? Well, I'm always open to thinking outside the box, provided that the, the considerations still fall within the guidelines that are provided to us by the state. Now, I do think that there are some areas in the current guidelines that are a little bit vague. And so I am open to looking into those things, but we do need to make sure that the 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 guidelines that the state has provided to us are ultimately the ones that we all need to agree to. Uh, but I am certainly open uh, to, to ways to work within those guidelines to help do the right thing for our kids. Thank you, Jennifer. Raquel Steven from WXXI. Yes, good afternoon. Um, my question is, I know studies show that the transparency with the system and the J&J &J vaccine kind of boosted vaccine confidence, but there's so many appointments available. How do we speak to this? Why are there so many appointments available when studies are showing that vaccine confidence has skyrocketed? Well, I, I do think, uh, Raquel, we're at that point. Um, and we're, we're right on the bubble of that point where uh, the supply and the and demand is about, to, is about to switch. I believe we're almost there. Um, for several months, we were at this, we were, um, we were here talking about um, almost, we refer to like the Hunger Games style, right, of getting an appointment. You know, appointments are available, everybody rushes online, they fill up in about five minutes time. So we grew accustomed to that type, working in that type of environment. That's no longer the case. Right now, uh, there's uh, almost any day of the week and any time, that you want to make an appointment, there's an appointment available. So now what we have to do is change our messaging and our strategy to let people know that there should be confidence in the vaccines, the vaccines work, the vaccines are lowering uh, the rate of infection amongst those who are taking them, and the vaccines though now, it's critically important, are available. And so we really need to now so do that. The other thing that we need to do, which we've started to do, is, is, is work on perhaps um, barriers to access to the vaccine that have existed. Um, we've announced a hotline today so we can help bridge that digital divide if that was an issue. We're also working to bring more vaccine closer to where people live. Um, so over the last several weeks, one thing you know, we've been working on actually since the beginning of the, of the vaccine process is working on um, uh, bringing, uh, uh, we, we call them these uh, pop-up pods um, that have been uh, that have been coming up in areas, particularly around the city of Rochester and in some rural uh, locations um, that are part of the region um, uh, to reach populations where where the uh, vaccination rate is lower than the average, um, and uh, and those have been done with with, with real success. We we had, uh, last week kicked off four uh, new locations within the city of Rochester and zip codes where they were where they were performing 10% under. Uh, where the county average was, and we nearly filled those appointments um, uh, uh, last week, and we're filling those appointments again this week as well. So I think that's another strategy that's going to be helpful in reaching people. Um, uh, but I, I do think we need to start to change our message. We need to be looking at the fact that we want to get back to normal. We want to enjoy our summer. Nobody wants a summer like last year. Um, in order to do that, you have to be thinking now. Now is what you have to do. Just like last year when we talked about the surge, right? And you're talking about how to flatten the curve. The, um, and when you're looking, you know, with the, with the incubation period of the, of the virus, you're always talking about think about what your actions today will affect what the community health looks like two weeks from now, right? That was always the message at the beginning of the pandemic. Now the message is the same, but it's around the vaccine. Think about where you want to be five weeks from now or six weeks from now. That depends on the action you take today. So if you decide, if you're out there right now watching this, if you decide you want to take the vaccine today, you will have the immune effect of that vaccine either five weeks from now or six weeks from now, depending on which vaccine you take. So it's in your hands 
right now, the health of this community is in all of our hands. What we want to look like on Memorial Day, what we want to look like in June and July, is entirely up to the choices you make today about whether or not you access those appointments that are available today. Okay, Brian Sharp from the Democrat and Chronicle is next. Thank you. A uh, uh, somewhat follow up <clears throat> on that question about um, the, the appointment availability. I was I just did a quick look back to what we're seeing in gains for people who are vaccinated. And I was wondering if um, you could elaborate a little bit on just what you're seeing. It looks like there's a considerable fall off in people getting first dose uh, and second dose down, you know, in the 40 to 50 percent week over week. Is that getting to the point of concern that we could be reaching where we're topping out? Well, you know, from my standpoint, as the vaccination program has evolved, um, I don't think anybody assumed that the, um, the, the ease or the, the effort necessary to get that next 10% was going to remain the same. Um, as we have, you know, seen throughout the, the, the first uh, several months of this program, you know, you have the early adopters, if you will, the people who you didn't really need to convince very much to get the vaccine. I think we're out of that phase now. I think we're entering the phase of people who have legitimate concerns, who want to wait and see, who want to clarify and, and have their questions answered. And it's on us to help uh, meet them at a place where they can have those questions answered, where they can um, hear the, the thoughts and the considerations and all the things that, that people may be uncertain about. Um, and so we need to evolve, we need to adapt to the, the changing needs of our community. Um, and I, I'm not sure that the mass vaccine site is going to be the, the primary way we get ourselves to the goal. Um, we're going to have to look for ways to get the vaccine out into the doctor's offices, into pharmacies, into other settings in the community that are more convenient to people. Um, people have more choices now. And with J&J, &J, there was the hope that we would have a one-dose vaccine. Um, now that that's off the table for the time being, I think people need to you know, regroup and uh, reevaluate. And we need to do our part to make sure that we meet them uh, at a place that's convenient and uh, that makes sense for them. I apologize. Hopefully, I'm not repeating here. I just step away for a bit. But uh, how? What is the progress in terms of um, figuring out how to replace or what to do uh, for those places where you're preferring to have the J and J, the incarcerated population, the at home? Are you any further in figuring out how to do that? Well, you know, having uh, lost the J&J &J for the time being is, a, is certainly a setback. Um, we will continue our efforts. We'll be replacing the J&J &J with Pfizer or Moderna, as it were. Obviously, now we uh, will have to figure out how to have two visits, which will slow us down. Um, but I do think that at some point in the future, the Johnson & Johnson will uh, re-enter the market. Um, I don't know when that will be, so I'm not going to wait for it necessarily. So we just need to uh, regroup and uh, change our approach. And it will take a little bit longer now that we need to have two visits for every one that we used to have with J&J. &J. But our commitment to these populations is the same. So we just need to, you know, we have our work cut out for ourselves to, to get that job done. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I know 13 WAM is recording. I'm not sure if there's a reporter on the call. Yes, hi, I'm here. It's Jane Chaco. Um, I had a question for, uh, on schools for Dr. Mendoza. Realistically, do you think seventh grade seven through twelve secondary schools will be able to return for the fourth marking quarter that our rates will drop by then? Well, it would take a pretty sizable effort for us to turn things around, but i'm I'm uh, optimistic that we can do that. Um, our numbers right now are are pointing in the wrong direction, but I do think that uh, as the the warmer months set in, uh, as more people get their vaccine, I think there is a fair chance that we can turn things around such that it uh, makes sense for the middle and secondary schools to uh, reopen more fully. Um, but right now, the rates are not nearly uh, close uh, to a point where we can really uh, consider that in the, in the near term. Uh, I think it would be at least two weeks, frankly, before that were uh, to happen based on what I'm seeing in the numbers. But I'm happy to be surprised. If we can turn this around more quickly, I'm all open for reopening more fully. But I, I do think that we want to make sure that we do this safely. Nobody ever wanted to reopen schools in an unsafe way. Uh, I understand that the voice is strong to reopen schools. Uh, the voice is strong from parents who are also concerned and want to make sure that the school is the safe place for them 
uh, to send their children. And so from my standpoint in the health department, I have an obligation to both parties to make sure that we are following the data and making sure that the schools truly are safe uh, to reopen. Thank you. And for the county executive, I wanted to get your opinion about the vaccine mandate in Erie County for um, the Buffalo Bills fans. Yeah, I saw that announced. You know, you know, it's a, yeah, you know, we, I was analogizing it a little bit in my head to, you know, sort of how things are going to work with the Rochester Red Wings, right? When also when opening day comes up uh, in May. Obviously, the football, uh, the Bills games, are not going to start till late August, uh, early September, and the world's going to look a lot different then um, than I think it looks now. So I think time will tell what the appropriate strategy is for that. Um, you know, I think right now the strategy for outdoor venues, um, you know, like again, like I said, I go back to the Red Wings um, that are having their opening day in the next month. The, the approach now I think is right based on where we are in the pandemic. So for Frontier Field, um, we'll have you know the the the, uh, the capacity requirement and then also the vaccine or testing requirement to meet that capacity and I think that's appropriate for where we are right now uh, in the process but where we are in late August or early September um, is going to be you know the world could look like a very different place so um, you know what what I would say is in the message community is that when we, we want to get back to being able to go to Red Wings games be able to go uh, to the Bills games this fall uh, and be able to do that. We really do need to double down right now because your actions now, right, again, projecting the future. So if you want to go to a Bills game, you want to be able to go to a Red Wings game, you want to do all these things just like I do, it's incumbent upon us then to say, well, what can I do to make this a healthier place? What can I do to make the community healthier is to get a vaccine. And if you're choosing not to get a vaccine, it's continue to follow the public health guidelines to slow the spread and lower the spread of the community so you're not getting people sick. The quickest we can get there is the quickest we get back to normal. Thank you. Our final question today comes from Patty Singer with Minority Reporter. I hope it was worth the wait. So I've been thinking about this all week, Dr. Mendoza, and I said last week I was bad at science. I'm still bad at science. But my question is, how does the vaccine work against variants if variants weren't around when the vaccine was developed? Well, these variants are not totally different forms of the virus. They are um, slight modifications, gen genetic mutations of the original virus, but by and large, they are in the same family. Um, but the answer to your question really lies in the research and the experience that we're conducting both here in the United States, here in Rochester, frankly, as well as across the globe. And so far, all of the evidence points to the fact that the vaccines that are available now Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson are all effective against the circulating variants that are present, uh, we believe, here in Monroe County and, frankly, across um, the United States. Um, there is some concern, obviously, with Michigan. People are paying attention to Michigan and Brazil because they have the P1 variant. Um, there is some uh, concern around that, but based on uh, the available evidence around the B117 UK variant, um, everything is pointing to the fact that the available vaccines are all effective. And so this, this is all based on, on research that's happening in labs, as well as uh, actual experience that's happening in the real world. So unlike flu, say, way, the flu vaccine, where every year it's a little bit different based, you know, so they have to adapt it. There's no changing in these vaccines to, for adapting for, for variants. That's currently correct. Um, the flu vaccine works differently than the COVID vaccines do. Um, and there is still some uh, outside concern if these variants evolve to a point that they begin to evade the existing uh, vaccines. That would be the scenario. And